for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday morning, December the 29th, 1979. Men Winter Camp Meeting, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Lee Ellen Woods, San Fernando, California, is teaching in the morning service. I might suggest also that uh, perhaps there are some of you that are uh, living in isolated places and you don't have a body of Christ church to attend, I'm sure that there are people here like that, and I believe it would be pleasing to the Lord if uh, you would help this work on a monthly basis. Do you have people doing that, Glenn? All right. Some of you that, uh, uh, you know, are isolated and, and uh, so on, uh, it'd be wonderful if you would just remember this work on a monthly basis, you know, $5 a month, $10 a month, $1,000 a month, or, you know, whatever. Praise the Lord. The Bible says to bring all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse. I haven't checked this out yet, but the other day I heard somebody say that in the Hebrew, that word for storehouse is armory. This, no. Is this an armory? You didn't catch this yet. Yes, this is an armory. Oh, okay. Yes, it is. Fine. This is a garrison. It's, that's, a, that's an armory. An armory. That's, we've been prophesied too many times that this is a garrison. A garrison is an armory. Yes. It's a place where you prepare for battle. You have, you have their weapons stored. We have, uh, you mentioned about a monthly basis. We have several who have never been here. We've never seen them. They've never seen us. We have a doctor, New York, a lawyer somewhere, and they faithfully, the Lord told them, to supply monthly checks to us here. And they have faithfully for a long time and many more. But these two come to my mind particularly, a doctor and a lawyer, who faithfully send them a check every month to support this work here. Yet they have never been here, never seen us, and we've never seen them. And that's when, when, when it works out of way, you know it's gone. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you are enjoying these new songs that David is bringing? All right. You got some more new ones, too? They have quite a few of these things over there in Van Nuys that, you know, sing out here, so maybe you can keep some more of them. Praise the Lord. I thought this morning that uh, we would refer just very briefly to the uh, remaining night visions and then open up the... Uh, meeting for questions, and hopefully some answers. Uh, some of you folks perhaps will be leaving. You've been through several days of, of uh, teaching and so on. You may be leaving, and perhaps there are some areas that you don't quite understand, and uh, we would like very carefully to explain anything that uh, we know that you don't quite yet understand. So just keep this in mind. We want to confine our, our questions this morning to... Uh, well, the things that we've been talking about. Now, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not an authority on all kinds of things. I told you I'm not a theologian, and uh, I'm not interested in the controversies of the past, and the Lord knows we've had plenty of them. But I believe that God is opening up a whole new body of truth, a whole new body, and it's going to be as far beyond uh, the things that we've understood in the past as, well, as can be. Praise the Lord. So these are the things that uh, we're interested in. All right, over in the book of Zechariah then, and I'm just going to do this very, very briefly, just very briefly, just for the sake of, of completeness here. All right, in the um, fifth chapter, we have vision number six, and this is the vision of the flying scroll. And the flying scroll is written upon on two sides, and it goes through all the earth, and uh, it goes into every house, every house, and... Uh, the only way that I can identify this scroll is by its measurements. And uh, this scroll was 10 by 20 cubits. All right, here's our tabernacle up here, and here's the sacred building. And uh, the measurement of the holy place is 10 by 20 cubits. And I think it's the only time in the scriptures when this measurement is found, 10 by 20 cubits. And so it appears likely that Along the line here somewhere, God is going to give the holy place people a ministry throughout all the earth, and it's going to be a ministry of blessing and of cursing. It's going to enter into every house, 
And when you say house, dear, you could say apartment and igloo and a kraal and a house on stilts over in Indonesia, grass shacks. But the word of the Lord is going to come to every house upon the face of the earth. And uh, perhaps here it's indicated that the holy place people are the ones that are going to do this and perhaps during the seven-year period. You see, we've been talking about the mountains of the Lord and about the house of the Lord. And, and uh, in the preceding chapter, uh, we, we have some things about the house of the Lord here and so on. But it has to do with grace. But in this vision, this has to do with judgment. And so if people will not accept grace, then God is going to bring judgment. And so every house that is not of God is going to be torn down, going to be destroyed. The judgments of God are going to go into every house upon the face of the earth. All right, then beginning with verse 5, you have kind of a remarkable vision here. A woman sitting in an ephah. Roughly speaking, an ephah is a bushel basket. And uh, I believe that here we have the picture of Babylon. Uh, there's a woman sitting in this basket, and then there's a talent of lead put it upon the top of the basket, and the basket is carried to Shinar. The basket goes back to its place. I believe that Shinar here uh, is not just the Babylon of, uh, that we know about, but, uh, but the um, uh, spiritual Babylon, the, the place of hell, the place of the abode of Satan. And I think that here what God is telling us is this, that the whole Babylonian system is going to be confined and a talent of lead is going to be put upon this woman and I think that she is called wickedness here this woman is called wickedness we have the same expression over in the Old Testament with reference to Athaliah the daughter of Jezebel she is called wickedness and uh, the same expression is used in con concerning Antichrist he's called wicked we have a translated wicked one but uh, more properly it's called the wicked and so this seems to speak to us of, of that whole Babylonian system and that God's going to put it in a basket and uh, send it back to hell. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. See, what God is doing here, he's dealing with houses. And this is the false house in verse 11. And he said to build for it an house in the land of Shinar and it shall be established and set there upon its own base. In other words, the... Uh, uh, the house of wickedness is going to be brought back into its own place, which I believe are the infernal regions. All right, then, in uh, chapter 6, you have the picture here of the mountains. He says, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze or of brass. And, uh, you know, we have been telling you that the... Uh, uh, mountain of the Lord equates with the sacred building. And the top of the mountain is Zion, and this is the same as the Holy of Holies, and, and here's Jerusalem down here, and that equates with the holy place. But you remember we showed you in the Old Testament that uh, um, there were two mountains, because God had not yet brought together uh, the, um, had not yet brought together the elements of the birthright, and so in the old Israel there were two mountains. And so, one mountain here is, is Zion, and this is the place where the king's palace was. It's the kingship. It is uh, Zerubbabel. The other mountain is Moriah. Remember that Abraham offered his son upon Mount Moriah. And uh, this is the place of the temple. Over here is the place of the palace. Over here we have the temple and, and uh, we have the priests. And so, in the Old Testament context, there were the two mountains. Remember, we showed you, though, that God is going to join the two mountains together once again, and they're going to become one mountain, so that God's sacred building people are not going to be divided into kings and priests, but all of them, at one time, become kings and priests, or a royal priesthood. All right, I think the message here is that there's coming a time when these two mountains are going to become mountains of brass of bronze. This speaks of judgment. See, God is building up Zion now. And it says over in the Psalms that when he builds up Zion, he's going to appear. And he's building up Zion right now. And uh, I'm looking for the appearing of the Lord at any time. So some of you say, well, Brother Ellen Wood, if, if you believe in all of that, what about the revival that's coming? What about the restoration that's coming? Well, I keep telling people the coming of the Lord 
is not an interruption, but it is an acceleration of the work of God. I started to say something the other day, and I never did finish it. When I get home, you know, I, I go over some of the things I said, and, <coughs> and I usually think of things that I didn't finish up and so on. But um, there are, are folk that have had prophecies given over them, and so far there's not been a fulfillment of the prophecies. Now, you see, many of these prophecies are for a coming day, even for the time after the coming of the Lord. You see, here's no problem. I uh, used the illustration of Stanley Fraction here, whom many of you knew, a very godly man, editor of the Pentecostal Evangel uh, of the Assemblies of God for many, many years. And when the latter rain movement came, um, he went up to um, uh, Detroit, to where Sister Beale had the work up there, and a prophecy went out over Brother Frodsham. And it must have been a tremendous prophecy. I don't know just what it was, but it was a tremendous prophecy, so tremendous, in fact, that the people broke out in worship, and the worship lasted for about an hour. And uh, it, it took about an hour before things subsided after this prophecy. Well, Brother Frodsham later on died. Now, with me, there's no problem here, because, you see, when the Lord comes back, he's bringing the anointed ones with him, and uh, so the prophecy... It's going to be fulfilled at a later time. All right, so here are the two mountains, and the mountains become brass. In other words, these kings and priests are going to have a ministry of judgment. I want you to know this, a ministry of judgment. Now, all the way through, judgment is involved. There's a church within a church at the present time. We call them the overcomers or whatever. These people are judging themselves now. That's what deliverance ministry is about. I sometimes wonder, well, who's going to deliver the deliverers? I've seen some of the folk who claim to be deliverers in years gone past, you know, and, and uh, they themselves were bound by so many things. Well, the deliverers first have to be delivered because, you see, over in Romans it says that we are, that creation is going to be released into the liberty of the sons of God. The sons of God first have to come into liberty and then the rest of creation is going to come into that liberty. So God has to have a nucleus of people somewhere that are completely delivered. And this is what is happening now. All right, so these people are being judged now. The Lord, at his coming, is going to move them up here, up into the Holy of Holies. But they have to be judged out here because the Holy of Holies is not the place for judgment. We cannot bring sin and all of these things up into the Holy of Holies because... God does not admit anything unclean into the Holy of Holies. So these people now are judging themselves, and then later on they're going to judge in the church. And then when this ministry is finished, then they're going to judge in the outer court, generally speaking, in, in, uh, throughout the earth. All right, so these mountains then, Zion and Moriah, which is up here, Zion and Moriah, are going to be mountains of brass. I... Uh, I have a friend, uh, an Assembly of God minister that is moving in this direction, and he told me one time that the church is soon going to see the greatest upheaval in its midst that the world has ever seen, the church. When God begins to release these sons of God into the body of Christ's church, into the holy place, and begins to cleanse it, I want to tell you, it's going to be something. And then after this is accomplished, then they are released into the earth to purge the earth. And so... They are going to have a ministry of brass, a ministry of judgment, the Zion Moriah people. So this is pictured in the last of the night visions, praise the Lord. All right, so much for that. Now, do any of you have some questions you would like to ask? And again, I want to say, I want to confine it to the things we're talking about. All right, brother. Here. All right. Talk good and loud. I've been battling a cold and my ears are kind of stopped up a little bit here. Statement you just made there about the overcomers going to the holy of holies to come out and judge the church, and then the outer court, and then the the world. How will that be done? In other words, is it specifically be? Can you tell us that? What 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 will they actually do? All right. Let's go at this from two directions. Um, the uh, the uh, Bible the setting forth of it, and then the pragmatic part of it. Now. This is found over in the book of Malachi, found in the book of Jude, and it's found in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, among other places. 
as found, of course, in many, many places in the Old Testament. But these are three outstanding places. All right, now, in the book of Malachi, there's a little remnant. And uh, apparently, they're not in the driver's seat. You know, let's, let's say we're that little remnant. Only God knows. But let's say we're that little remnant. And so, in Malachi, these are the people that fear the Lord. And they talk one to another about his name, about the goodness of God, and so on. And then at the coming of the Lord, Malachi says, uh, or, or, or the Lord says in Malachi, they shall be mine. They shall be mine. And he seizes them. This is his peculiar treasure. And I want to say that this company of people that comes up into the Holy of Holies is the highest of all that God has ever created or will ever create. He will never create anything more wondrous than this company of people. All right, then Malachi says, and ye shall return, ye shall return. And uh, so, after being brought into the presence of the Lord, into the Holy of Holies, he says, ye shall return. And they're going to go back among God's people, and here are the sorcerers and the adulterers and all of these people that have mingled with the body of Christ. And they go up and they have discernment. And uh, they have uh, eyes like flames of fire, we discover from the book of Revelation. And they have feet that burn like brass in a furnace. And they go back and they discern. All right, then Jude's picture is that the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints. Now, keep in mind that there is always a difference between entering the kingdom and in being given the kingdom. Whenever you read about the kingdom in the New Testament, always discriminate. There's a difference. All right, so the new birth brings us into the kingdom. But Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To be given the kingdom is to go through the third veil. My Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All right, so it's a little flock, and yet Jude says, uh, that the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints. So it's going to be a big flock too. Relatively speaking, in comparison to the whole human race, it's a little flock. I don't know how many people have ever lived upon the face of the earth. Possibly it's been estimated 25 or 30 billions of people have lived upon the face of the earth. So you see, ten thousands is a small fragment of earth's population. So Jesus says little flock. Jude says that he's coming with ten thousands of his saints. All right, then you come to the book of Revelation, and when Jesus appears, he apprehends these people in his hand. He brings them up into the Holy of Holies, the earthly Holy of Holies, within the veil. And I believe that this is literal. I believe that he's going to give a message to John the Apostle. And John is going to be in charge, the Apostle John is going to be in charge of this ministration. And he will give the message of God to the lampstand churches which are the symbols of the Pentecostal charismatic realm. And then these seven stars or these overcomers, they come back and they begin to administer, they begin to administer the word of God to the backslidden apostate Pentecostal charismatic full gospel churches. Now, you have kind of a, of a precedent for this in the word of God. You remember that uh, over in the Old Testament it said, that there came a writing or a letter from Elijah to a wicked king, Jehoram. See, these are given letters. These are letters or messages from on the other side of the veil. And they're brought back to these on this side of the veil that weren't ready for the coming of the Lord. And so here's a, a very curious thing over in the Old Testament. And Elijah, from the other side of the veil writes a letter, and somehow or another, and I don't know how, it gets delivered to the wicked king. Elijah, at this time, had ascended or been changed, translated, some 10 or 11 years or 12 years before the letter was delivered to the wicked king. I think most of you have never heard that before, have you? But it's true. And this is a picture because this is the Elijah ministry. And so God is going to send seven letters to seven churches from the other side of the veil, but they're going to be carried by the Elijah company, and they're going to be delivered to the churches. All right, now, remember that 
This is the beautiful bride of Jesus Christ. And I keep telling people, we're not to disdain the churches. We're not just to be contemptuous and say, well, they're all Babylon. We're not to do that. This is the body of the body, and this is the head of the body. And I keep telling people, we're stuck with them. And whether they receive us or not, they're stuck with us. I kind of chuckle inside, you know, when we get rejected. You can't, they can't reject us. They're stuck with us. The Bible tells us that his sons are going to marry his daughters. There's going to be a union again. They're stuck with it. All right, now, remember that all kinds of people have invaded the holy place, the body of Christ's church. All kinds of people have invaded it. It's still the beautiful bride. And uh, we find in uh, Jude, I've gone through this several times, I think, here. In the book of Jude, you know, we have, have Cain. He joined the church. Cain has joined the church. You see, those that, that hold on to the teachings of Cain uh, really uh, uh, are, are, this is how Cain joins the church. He joins them through the people that hold on to his teachings. All right, what was there about Cain? Cain didn't have much time for blood. Remember that? And we have many people in the Pentecostal, charismatic, full gospel realm that do not highly regard the blood. I was in one congregation and the organist had told the pastor's wife, he said, I hope that you don't sing too many songs about the blood. In the uh, Roman Catholic system, of course, the direct effect of the blood is negated. And people are taught not to come directly to Christ, but to come through his mother, Mary. In many, many ways. Cain represents the way of the cross. Self-denial. Uh, what did I say there? Cain, uh, Cain disregards the way of the cross. The way of self-denial. He's not anxious to take up the cross and follow the Lord, see. So, in effect, Cain has joined the church. And then we have um, uh, Balaam, and Balaam has joined the church. Where is Balaam? You find all of this in the book of Jude. All right, Balaam is the man that has ministry for sale. One of our movie stars, for example, will come to your city and uh, for a fee of uh, $3,000. And I was telling this in one place up in Canada... One of the associate pastors came around to me afterward and he said, I, I want to correct you on that, Brother Ellen Wood. He said, because recently we've been having some negotiations with him and he's up the price now. It's $5,000. Inflation, I guess. All right. All right. Now, this can be seen in many, many ways. But the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the work of God, has been commercialized. Men are in it for gain. This is Balaam. See, Balaam has joined the church. And then you have Korah. And I don't need to say much about Korah because... <coughs> Korah speaks of rebellion. God has only one place for rebellion, and that's a hole in the ground. See, so many times our Pentecostal churches will say, well, if we let these people come in and sing for us and things like this, then uh, maybe we'll get them converted. It doesn't work that way. You're not going to convert them. They're going to pervert you. Now, when I teach along this line, I'm careful to make a clear distinction here. There's a difference between the body of Christ people, the beautiful bride of, of the Lamb, and the people that have invaded that place and perhaps have affected these people and blinded them and turned them from the ways of the Lord. But there's a difference, and Jude brings this out at the end of his book there, and he says uh, that we are to make a difference. We're to pull some people out of the fire, hating the garment that has been, been spotted and so on. All right, then in the book of Revelation, we find that, that um, Jezebel has joined the church. Now she's called Sister Jezebel. Sister Jezebel. She's in the church. She brings in Babylonianism. All kinds of Babylonianism. She had a daughter by the name of Athaliah. You see, at one time, in those days, in the days of Athaliah, Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah tried to make Jerusalem the world center for Babylonianism. This is an attempt of Satan to make Jerusalem the world capital. That's the significance of this incident there. And so Athaliah... The daughter of Jezebel married the king of Judah. And at this point, the devil was trying to make Jerusalem the world capital, his capital. So Jezebel and her children have joined the church. And all of these people, and we could go on and on here, all of these people have joined the church. But these sons are going to come back, and they're going to discern between the wicked and the righteous. Now, pragmatically, how does this work out? I don't pretend to know very much about it. But let's just imagine a few things. Let's say that, that um, what's tomorrow, Sunday? 
It's a good Babylonian name, isn't it, for the first day of the week? Sometimes I think the Quakers had about as much as we did. Remember, they always spoke of the first day of the week and the second day. All right. So let's say that uh, the Lord comes this afternoon. And I believe that the coming of the Lord is imminent. All right, suppose he were to come this afternoon. And, and um, these that were looking for his coming, these that were crying out for his coming, and so on. They're letting God work in their lives. So they come into changed body. Now, when you come into a changed body, among other things, you enter into the realm of invisibility, into the realm of the Spirit. Always keep in, in the mind the picture of Jesus between his resurrection and his ascension. That's a picture of it. He could appear and disappear at will and so on. Now, I don't know whether it's going to work this fast or not, but God has several things he's going to do when he brings these people beyond the veil into the realm of invisibility. He has several things he's going to do. But let's say that uh, it works very quickly. <coughs> and uh, so tomorrow morning, the Pentecostal churches all over America and all over the world are going to be jammed with people. Why? Because all of a sudden they are aware of the fact that a lot of people have disappeared. And this is going to excite them. This is going to stir them up. They're going to panic even. And they realize that they have missed something. I want to tell you, this part of the drama of God will never be repeated. If you miss the coming of the Lord, you'll never be a resident, as far as I can tell, of the Holy of Holies. All right, so the churches are going to be jammed. And perhaps the, the service opens, and when all of a sudden one of the one of the overcomers in his immortal body appears right in the midst of them. Now, this is how it could work. I'm just talking, of, I'm just using my imagination here. But this is how it could work in the pragmatic uh, sense here. He just appears in the midst of him. The pastor gets up to say a few words or something, and every, everybody's upset because they realize that a lot of people have, have disappeared. But all of a sudden, maybe a company of these uh, manifested sons. See, when you come through the veil, then you come into manifestation. And so here's one or two or a group of these manifested sons, and they stand in the midst of the congregation, and they take over. They take over. Remember now that they've got eyes like flames of fire, and they've got feet like that burn like brass in a furnace. And they can look right into every heart of every of all of those that are present. They can look right into their hearts, and they can tell whether it is a true sheep or whether it is a wolf wearing a sheep's clothing. They can tell, just like that. I can't always tell, can you? I've been fooled a number of times in my life. But in that day, they're going to know. Now, I don't know just how all of this is going to work out. But then they call upon the people to repent, because uh, we find in, in Revelation 2 and 3 that a part of this message is the call to repentance. And if these do not repent, then they're going to be judged. Some of them may drop dead. Some may be blinded for a season. Some may be paralyzed. But I tell you, there's going to be an upheaval in that service on, on Sunday morning, you know, going along with my story here. There's going to be an upheaval in that service. And this is going to go on. Some of them will have the pure word of God to minister. They're not going to have to use Bibles. But I want to tell you something. Up to that time, use your Bible. But the word of God says that the word of the Lord is going to come out of Zion. And the pure word of God is going to come out to people. Whatever is needed. Comfort, correction, and so on. And this kind of ministration may go on for several years. I don't know how long. Maybe for several years until finally the church comes into divine order and is purged. I should say purged first and then come into divine order. There's going to be, I think, something like that. As at least we can understand things from Revelation 2 and 3. All right. Somebody else have a question back there? Could you come on up and put it in the mic here? My ears are kind of plugged up here this morning. I have been subjected to the teaching of a man in northern Arkansas, and I received his teaching, and I'd like to bring it forth right now. Um, he teaches that Satan, too, is coming as... Who? Satan, too, is coming in like fashion, and that we're going to have to learn to know the difference. And uh, you said that, you know, he can, they're going to judge us and call us to repentance. Those are in that category. And I want to know how we're going to judge them. <laughs> okay. All right. I think one thing our sister's trying to tell us here is this. Um, a delusion has gone out in the midst of the Pentecostal people. 
fact, there's all kinds of delusion. Now, the word antichrist does not mean against Christ, but it means alongside of, alongside of Christ. Yes. Remember when we talk about the church, we talk about the spirit-baptized believers, because this was the church in the New Testament. Now, uh, uh, Margaret MacDonald, in the visions that God gave her back in 1830, brings this out uh, very remarkably. And uh, she was pressed in spirit when the Lord showed this to her, apparently. And she said that God's people were in great peril, in great peril, because Satan had an imitation for every doctrine, every practice of the church. And it was going to be so much like the real thing that many people were going to be deceived by it. We're living in that day now. And many things are coming forth that are so much like the real thing that many of God's people are turning aside. I could mention things like this, 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 this extreme uh, discipleship teaching and, and uh, the extreme prosperity teachings and, and so on. They look so much like the real thing that they're drawing off many of God's people. Now, Margaret MacDonald says that the only way that we shall be able to, to know the difference or be able to tell the difference is to have the real Christ on the inside of us. And I think she's got something there. So this is a day when I would say, let's open up unto our God and walk in holiness and walk in the fear of the Lord that he might indwell us because we are living in, in uh, perilous times. Brother Hoyer in Chicago, who studies the etymology of all of these words and so on, says that that word uh, perilous means wolfish times, like a wolf. It's the peril of a wolf. We're living in wolfish times. All right, is there another question? All right. Uh, you say that the sons of God will minister to the spirit-filled church in the holy place, but when the high priest goes into the holy place, uh, all the others have to go outside. And I was wondering how these relate. All right. Did you have another question while you're there? Is that it? All right. I see you had a book there. We've got quite a big shelf to put things on, haven't we? I've got a lot of things up on the shelf, too. All right, now... Uh, I think that he's talking about several things here. Uh, this maybe has a little bit to do with chronology. And uh, <clears throat> there's, uh, you remember that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. This was sometime usually in our month of September, or it would be in the um, uh, seventh month of the Jewish calendar. And uh, in other words, the Holy of Holies was opened for the high priest on one day of the year. Now, there are those that feel that perhaps that the Lord is going to come at that time of year and that this entering in is going to be on the Day of Atonement. And uh, I'll just say frankly, I don't know. Uh, it could be. But I want to point this out. I was uh, been studying along these lines a little bit, and a while back this thing came to me. Well, uh, before the Day of Atonement, there was another feast, you remember. There were three feasts in the last festival uh, season, and uh, the first was the Feast of Trumpets, then the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. And these three feasts taken together are the third festival season. So it came to me, well, are we looking for the wrong feast? I know people that um, when the Day of Atonement comes around, they'll, they'll have a special uh, time of waiting before God. They'll gather together over in Van Nuys. You know, we have folks that do that. All right with me. But you see, before the Day of Atonement is the Feast of Trumpets, and I believe that the appearing of the Lord would take place on the Feast of Trumpets. And then the entering in to the Heavenly Holy of Holies could take place on the Day of Atonement. That sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it? Let's put it like this. Up here is the heavenly structuring, and down here is the earthly structuring. Because you see, the coming of the Lord involves both structurings. In the book of Revelation, you find this very clearly. That when the Lord appears, he appears in the lampstand churches. This is the earthly structuring. When the Lord comes, he comes down here. <coughs> All right, this period of ministry then. See, down here we go into the realm of the Spirit, or the earthly Holy of Holies, and then we come back. All right, this period of ministry might last for several years. Then when it is accomplished, then there is an entering up into the heavenly Holy of Holies. And this very conceivably could be on the Day of Atonement. But I, I really don't have anything special on that. Uh, I'm 
kind of searching in that area. All right, brother? I hope you're all staying now within the subject. I was wondering if this uh, was talking about January's and these two men that would stoke withstood Moses in the days as, as they were working miracles, as Moses was working miracles, and these magicians. This is talking about the same yes. thing, right? Yes, Janice and Jambres. All right. Now, this what this hit me as I was sitting back there in the back. Uh, you said that Satan would cause strong delusion in the churches. Yeah. Now, it says that these two men, they did this until God withstood them. Mm-hmm. Now, this also means that if we... Uh, get ourselves in the fasting, I mean fasting and studying and, and praying uh, with God, that God will show us the difference between these strong delusions so that we will be able to discern Satan right on the spot, right? Yes. Okay, that's all. All right. I can only comment on this. Uh, how many of you have ever read uh, Annie's Visions? All right, a number of you have. I think that uh, you have them back on the book table, don't you? I don't think you have a complete set now. One is not, is not a print. Is it number four? Oh, number one. Okay. Now, Annie, in her visions, sees, uh, I think it's in the third book, she speaks of the sons of light and the sons of darkness, and they're all mingled together. When I go into a big meeting somewhere, a convention, I'm very, uh, I have this awareness. I think, Lord, I'm in a meeting now where the sons of light and the sons of darkness are all mingled together. And she says there, that the sons of darkness look so much like the sons of light that you can hardly tell the difference. They look so much like them that you can hardly tell the difference. Now, not only that, but she says the sons of darkness are going to flourish first. Frankly, I believe there are a lot of phonies operating in the Pentecostal full gospel realm. And I believe that they are flourishing first. And they're bringing forth sometimes miracles, and they're doing all kinds of things. And they're so much like the sons of light that the mass of the people out there can't tell the difference, and they go out after them. Now, that's about all I can do is to comment on this. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, we need to watch and pray uh, so that when these delusions come, we'll not be caught up in them. All right, our brother here? During this... Time at some time or another, uh, there'll be a new physical temple built in Jerusalem during the tribulation period. What does that have to do with uh, the, the two temples you're showing? All right. Um, I'm a little bit rough here. Excuse me. Maybe I have a hang-up. But I'm, for myself, I'm not very concerned about what's going over in the unholy land. A lot of people, you know, think it's a big thing if you can, you know, go to Mecca and... <laughs> It's going to do something for you, you know, to walk where Jesus walked and to sit down where Jesus sat down and get a piece of bark off on the olive tree where he prayed. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not very concerned because I believe that this is the Jerusalem and this is the Zion. This is it here. And when people ask me, I said this the other night, if people ask me if I've ever been to Jerusalem, I said, sure. I went to Jerusalem last night. <laughs> I've gone to Jerusalem this morning. I trust I'm among some of the Zion people, too. See? This is the important thing, these people. All right, now, I suppose you're referring to uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians, where Paul talks about, he said that uh, that day shall not come except there be a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Now, Paul knew nothing, as far as we know, about any temple ever being rebuilt over in Jerusalem. This is not in his thinking. And whenever Paul talked about the temple, he was talking about the people. He was talking about the people of God. This was the temple. Ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) After hearing our sister this way. All right, so, that day will not come except there be a falling away first. And I think all you have to do is to open your eyes a little bit and you'll see that there's a falling away. All right, then, how about the man of sin being revealed? This expression, man of sin, is found only one time in the Bible, as far as I know. And... uh, It could refer to the Antichrist, and I still believe that there is a person called Antichrist. That uh, first Adam that Bill is telling us about, that's the man of sin. And uh, he's already revealed in the temple among God's people. He's already revealed if you've got eyes to see it. 
In other words, God's beautiful spirit-baptized people have been taken over largely by the man of sin or by the fleshly nature, sometimes expressed in men, that the man of sin is already here and he's already sitting in the temple and he is saying, I'm God. I'm going to run things. That part is fulfilled right now. Now, is it uh, possible that there's going to be a temple rebuilt? It could be. I'm not against the idea. And I understand the Jews at the present time are building what, they're called, what they call the great synagogue over in Jerusalem, but it's not upon Mount Moriah, not upon, uh, you know, the temple site. And uh, I've been told that uh, they're planning to reinstitute the uh, old Levitical uh, priests. Uh, uh, they're going to have this Levitical priesthood and the offerings and sacrifices and so on. And that could be. But for us, for us, because we live right here, this is the temple. We are that Jerusalem and hopefully that Zion people. And we've got to be constantly aware that a man of sin, the fleshly nature, wants to take over. So I'll just leave that there. All right? Sure, you come in. Come on over here. Um, just a thought for you. Um, there is a scripture in Amos and also in the book of Acts that says that he's going to raise again David's tabernacle. Now, the temple that the people are looking for is not necessarily a temple in Jerusalem, but David's tabernacle that set upon Mount Zion. And David's tabernacle was a holy of holies only. It had no outer court. It had no holy place. It had only the holy of holies. And the curtains were drawn back, and out of it the glory of the Lord and the ministry of the Lord could be seen. And this could very well be the temple that everybody's looking for, but not a temple on uh, uh, Mount Moriah, but on a temple on Mount Zion. And Zion is the church, not a place over there. And so the Holy of Holies, God's children, are going into that third veil, and there will be the temple, and the ministry will come out of that Holy of Holies. That's David's tabernacle. He'll raise up the ruins thereof that have been destroyed, but now it's a spiritual temple, just as there was a physical uh, a body uh, called Israel. Now there's a spiritual body called the body of Christ. And as there was a physical temple, there will be a spiritual temple, the Holy of Holies only. The rest of the church is down at Shiloh. They still think they're still down there with the old tabernacle, and they don't know the blessing's gone. But God's restoring Mount Zion. Amen. Glory be to God. Praise the Lord. Very good, David. Praise the Lord. Uh, one more remark about uh, David's tabernacle. It was a movable temple. It was a tent. It wasn't permanent. It was a temporary thing. But there, there was, was the Holy of Holies under this tent that could be moved from place to place, even though it stayed there, but it still, it still represented that it, it wasn't a thing that was built there permanent and, and not to be moved. It was as a temporary thing, but it was the Holy of Holies. Praise the Lord. It wasn't a literal building as we're taught, taught to think about. It was temporary. Another thing that, that kind of bothers me, I'm going to say it, uh, uh, Bill used it, Brother Ellenwood uses it, others use it, and it bothers me. That's the word Jew. I think many times that's used in the wrong place. The word Hebrew should be used, yeah. or Zion. We're hung up on the word Jew. And, and if you study that out, you'll find that uh, we shouldn't use that the way we use it. Okay. Uh, I, I hope that some of you uh, y y use uh, that word a little different and, and, and use Hebrew and Israelite in many places instead of saying Jew. All right. Very good. Praise the Lord. Thank you, David. Uh, there's something else now. That, now, this is being restored. Now, accompanying the building of David's tabernacle when he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in. Now, down in Shiloh, in the old temple, it was, an, it was a quiet worship. We've all come out of the quiet worship. Haven't we? Be pious, be quiet. But now, what does David do? David dances before the Lord with all his heart. He appoints singers and musicians that sing and shout and praise the Lord day and night. And this is what is happening to the church right now. We're coming into a new liberty of worshiping the Lord. We're coming into the the music and the background to establish Amen. that worship that accompanies that holy of holies. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And, and so it's all tying in. 
And uh, just like so many things, the, the world or the church world is looking in the wrong direction, and they don't see those things that are actually taking place right now in the establishing of your worship. So you learn to enter into the worship of God. It's important. Amen. Learn to enter into the worship of God and the praise of God, because God's going to appear in that double portion of incense that Brother Britton talked about last night, and that's the praise. Every time you worship and praise the Lord, you're helping to usher back the Lord. You're making the condition, you're making the, uh, the tabernacle of David, the Holy of Holies, or the, the worship place, conducive for God to come back and inhabit the praises of his people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many thousand did he appoint to, to sing and to play as they brought the ark up? I'm looking for it here, but it was several thousand. And, and they, they did it with loud cymbals and tambourines. Very annoying. We'll have to get some cymbals here then. We got some tambourines. <laughs> All right, I'll push you back here. Oh, you got tambourines. Come on up here, sister, if you can. Oh, I think uh, Glenn's wanting me on the plate, you see. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, are these uh, the same or is there a difference? Uh, in, you were talking about the anointed ones, the. the olive trees that stand by the Lord of the whole earth yesterday in, in uh, Zechariah 4, 14 and then in Revelations 4 or 11 4 I mean uh, these are the two olive trees talking about the two witnesses and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth and I'm just wondering what the uh, differences are or if it's the same or what's your Alright I'm going to have to tell you on that I don't know now uh, different ones have different explanations on this and uh, just frankly, I'm going to have to tell you I don't know. The, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the uh, two olive trees up here, these are people that have come into redeemed bodies, and therefore they could not be killed. These uh, two witnesses, or these two olive trees, can be killed. And it's quite possible that these two olive trees might be out of the holy place people later on after the church has been purged, or it may represent the ministry of that church. And... Uh, because out of that body of Christ church there may be many martyrs, or out of the believers may be many martyrs. But uh, I, I know David's sitting on the edge of his seat here, and I'm not even looking at him. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, fine. He has something along that line. All right, and another question here. In Revelation 12, there are three groups of people that are mentioned, like the uh, man-child, the woman, and the remnant. Now, would the remnant be the ones in the outer court and the woman being the bride of Christ in the holies? Well, the man-child, of course, is the uh, group of overcomers that comes out of the, that comes out of the uh, church, which is the sun-clothed woman. Um, again, these are areas that I'm not very sure on uh, myself. The remnant of her seed may possibly be converts that she makes uh, during the seven-year period. I think you have a very poor quality of chalk out here in Arkansas. Half, yeah, that's right. I'm turning all of your holes into halves here. All right, so here's the sun-clothed woman out here, and here's the man-child, and I think there's no problem with that. And the remnant of her seed may possibly uh, be the converts uh, that she will have, because, again, we see this sun-clothed woman, that, that scroll, uh, that 10 by 20 cubit scroll that goes throughout all the earth. And I believe that the woman... Uh, is not just going to be holed up somewhere on the earth, although I do believe that there are places of refuge that are being prepared, but I do believe that she's going to have a ministry too. And uh, so this may be the remnant of her seed. All right? Hey, can you walk your ever part of the Mother Wilhite from Tulsa, Oklahoma minister? No. Okay. On Revelation? He gives a very distinct uh, revelation on that two uh, witnesses that she was asking about. And he explains that as being back in the dark ages that we read about, after the, all the apostles, you know, and all about people who were that the Christ died and they were to the church. He says that the Old Testament and the New Testament died during that time. It was very, you, what little bit was heard of it was in secret, mm -hmm. you know. If you read the history of that, well, you will mm -hmm. really learn more about it. But that's the way he explains that scripture. Mm -hmm. And he's very deep in Revelation. If you've never heard him, you ought to go and hear it. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Now, my uh, my viewpoint on that, and I don't uh, wish to uh, uh, controvert um, Brother Wilhite here, because I uh, I recognize there are many different viewpoints. But uh, I view the whole book of Revelation as yet future. The whole book. Now, the Praetorist interpretation of the book of, uh, of Revelation, if you want to be a theological, it's called the Praetorist, uh, regards that much of the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. And uh, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, use the Praetorist in approach to the book of Revelation. And so a lot of these things, you know, the stars falling and everything like that, they say have already taken place. But... Uh, the way that I see it is that uh, the Lord appears, the coming of the Lord takes place in chapter 1, and that's future. Of course, it might not be too future. It might be within the next five minutes. And uh, then the next thing that happens is the purging of the church, and the next thing that happens is the purging of the outer court. And I see it all as, as future. Now, it is true. You see, all of the days of God, all of the feasts of God have reflections backwards and forwards. Always keep this in mind. Even before... Jesus died upon the cross, people got saved, because Calvary had a reflection back into the Old Testament. And uh, the day of Pentecost, it had a specific fulfillment, and we're living in the period of that specific fulfillment, but it has a reflection on into the future, because there are coming uh, future outpourings of the Spirit. And so, many of the things of the Scriptures will have meanings backwards and forward, uh, uh, perhaps, and, and the brother sees in that, that area. See? But I think that, that taking it on uh, first basis that the whole book of Revelation is yet future. Okay, brother, sorry to keep you waiting so long. Concerning the, the coming of the Lord, do we have a New Testament, say a New Testament type uh, in, in John and in Paul as they were, as Paul was caught up to the third heaven and John was caught up to the throne of God? Are they a type of the coming of the Lord for the New Testament? Are they a type of the two olive trees? Yes, I think so. Uh, see, the, uh, the word uh, caught up in the Greek is uh, harpezo or something like that. I, uh, I just want to tell you folks, I'm no Greek and Hebrew authority at all. I just dig it out like you do out of the concordance. But uh, this particular Greek word is used uh, four or five times. It's used with reference to Paul when he was caught up. And I believe he was caught up into the Holy of Holies. It's the type of us being caught up and so on. And then the same word is used in connection with Philip. And Philip was caught up. And he was caught up into the air and uh, transported. It's the same word. And it's a picture of the same thing that's coming. And then the word is used in connection with the man-child. And uh, I think also John, isn't it, in Revelation, the fourth chapter, in the first verse. And uh, so this Greek word, wherever it is used, seems to have uh, to give meaning to the catching up that is coming. You see, there is a rapture. Only I don't use that name. I use it because other people use it. There is a catching up. There is a catching up, but not the way people teach it. There's, you cannot find one place in the word of God where it says that the Lord is coming to catch away his waiting bride. You can't find one place in Scripture where the Lord's coming to catch away his waiting bride. He's coming. He's coming to transform people. The early Christians were not looking to be caught up immediately. They were looking to be changed. First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is what was uppermost in their minds, to be changed. God's going to have a company of changed people here upon the face of the earth. And this will include at least all of the anointed ones from the day of Pentecost on down. And I tell my friends that are looking for apostles, don't worry, you're going to get them. Maybe you wish you hadn't had them after they've been here a while. But these apostles are going to be back. John's going to be back. And Paul and all of these people are all going to be back. And God's... Uh, uh, anointed people, at least from the day of Pentecost on down, and perhaps from the Old Testament, are going to be ministering here upon the earth. This is something that everybody overlooks, I think. Uh, but they're going to be here ministering upon the face of the earth for a, maybe a period of several years in order to purge the church and bring it into divine order. All right, sister. Well, since you brought up the apostles, um, you brought that up yesterday, and I would like you to expand on it a little bit. You said that... that God would bring the apostles back. Mm -hmm. I would like to know why you don't feel that he could raise up new apostles, why he has to bring them back. All right. This is kind of a sticky question here. And uh, sometimes I give people the impression I'm, I'm against apostles. Now, um, I'm not against apostles. But, um, okay, there are three orders of apostles. Jesus Christ is the chief apostle. And then we have the order of the twelve. And they were apostles in the church. And there are also they are also called the apostles to the kingdom of God. 
And uh, in the um, New Jerusalem, in the New Jerusalem, you remember that the names of the twelve apostles are in the foundation of the of the city, of the mountain. And so they are the foundation of the body of Christ's church. But the church is not complete. I wanted to talk about this, but I didn't get to it. See, right now the church is like this. It's a truncated mountain. Now, at the coming of the Lord, when God brings the headstone into position, then the mountain will be completed. These are the sons. All right. Now, over in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, it says there that God has given apostles and prophets and so on for the uh, work of the ministry and the adjusting of the body of Christ and so on until we come to the perfect man. But it does not say that the apostles are going to bring about the perfect man. We have it until then. And then this is further verified from, as we, we gave this to you, I think, last night, or last night, uh, yesterday morning. It's also verified from uh, 1 Corinthians, the, the um, 13th chapter. And there we're told that um, uh, all of these offices and, and uh, gifts and so on are in part until that which is perfect is come. So it follows that the apostles cannot bring perfection. They cannot bring perfection. They work in this area. See, they work in this area, they keep on building, but they cannot bring this up here. And the house of the Lord isn't finished until this comes into position. All right, so the question arises, should we have apostles today? I think we should have apostles today. But um, there's a curious thing, you see, over in Revelation, the second chapter, the lampstand church of uh, Ephesus says there concerning this church that, that they tried those who said they were apostles and found that they were liars. So, um, I look at these men that claim to be apostles, and uh, I'm sorry to say, I think some of them are liars. Now, how do you know? Well, several things. For example, a true apostle of the Lord will be an apostle to the whole church. He won't incorporate himself, go to Sacramento, that's our state capital in California, and, and take out incorporation papers and give himself a fancy name, and then in the bylaws and so on, make himself the apostle of his organization. It doesn't work that way. A true apostle will be an apostle to all of God's people. Wherever he goes, he will be an apostle to them. Uh, the true apostle will have, I'm talking now about a real 24 karat apostle. A true apostle will have an understanding and a revelation of the word of God beyond others. And I know of no man today that is called an apostle that has any particular understanding of the Word of God any more than anybody else might have. In fact, is some of them are divisive in what they teach. Okay. Another thing about an apostle is, and David was going like this, an apostle is a poor man. He's a poor man. Remember Peter and John said, silver and gold have we none. Many of these men that call themselves apostles are enriching themselves at the expense of God's people. He's a poor man. When people sold their houses and so on, they, they brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Didn't put it in their hands. Laid it at their feet. Now, I ask the question, how much money can you pick up with your toes and put in your pocket? Now, there is room for apostles. Only I haven't found them yet. There's room for them, but I haven't found them. And all of the apostles that I know of a work within their own structures. And there's no such thing as an apostle to a structure, uh, a human structure. An apostle ministers to the whole body. Another thing, when God brings forth the apostolate, it is not going to be one man, it's a company. I know several men that claim to be apostles, but boy, they never get together on anything. They've divided the country up and, and uh, don't you come over into my territory. They work in a company. If God gives us apostles before the coming of the Lord, you're going to see this. They're going to work as a company of men. A company. So there are many, many things in here uh, that can help us to discern the true apostle. A friend of mine was telling me about a man that uh, uh, claims to be an apostle. And he knew this man, knew him in Bible school. And uh, he said that this particular man was in a, was in a church. And uh, he had come there, I suppose, with his... Uh, um, you know, further out ministry to help in this group of people. And the pastor had to go out to the meeting, I suppose, to answer the telephone or something. And while he was out, the apostle told the people, he said, Now, you should get rid of your pastor. 
He's not the man that should be the pastor of this church here. Now, I don't believe that a true apostle would do such a thing as that. I know another man that claims to be an apostle, and he divorced his, his uh, wife and married his secretary. If I could find a true apostle, I'd come under him. But I'm not going to come under uh, the leadership of a man who divorces his, his wife to, to marry his secretary. That's not in my book. And so far, so far, I, I, I've tried these people, and, and I found uh, I'm afraid that most of them are liars. All right, now, I want to say this. I think that in a lesser sense, we do have some men that have an apostolic ministry. I've heard of a brother, for example, over in India that God has used to raise up about 80 churches. And he's the father to these churches. And I would say that in a lower sense that this man is an apostle. I understand he's a very gracious man and, and uh, so on. And, and the churches are, are healthy churches and well-balanced churches and so on. And uh, so I do believe that there are men that may have ministries beyond that of the pastor or the evangelist and teacher or the prophet. And uh, that there may be an expression of an apostolic ministry. But I say that at the present point, I haven't seen the full expression of the apostolic ministry. But uh, I tell people not to worry, because when the Lord comes, he's going to bring the apostles back. All right, does that help anybody? One more question, and then uh, it's lunchtime, isn't it? Huh? You want time to go for a few minutes? All right, All right any other questions? Hallelujah. All right, all the questions are answered. Anybody else? All right, we'll better back here again. I've often read this in Matthew 24, and I needed some uh, enlightenment on this to understand it. And I do too. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever read it, let him understand. What do you mean? All right, now, in Matthew 24... Jesus is talking about two ends. If you will read the questions that the disciples ask at the beginning of the chapter there. And Jesus is talking about two ends. And um, in the Greek, I, I think I have this correct here, the word for end is telos. And the word for full end is the soon telia, something like that. Telos and soon telia. Now Jesus is talking about these two ends. Because they're asking him the question, what will be the sign of these things? Uh, maybe we better turn and just read that so we'll get the exact here. Matthew, the 24th chapter. I just want to tell my brother that there are still things in here that I don't fully understand, so I'm talking from that viewpoint. It said that Jesus uh, went out <coughs> and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him uh, to show him uh, the buildings of the temple and so on. And uh, then down in verse 3, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, parousia, and of the end of the age? The end of the age. And the word end here is the full end, or the suntelia, and it's translated in uh, Matthew, the 13th chapter, it's translated uh, consummation, the consummation of the age, at least that's in the margin. Now, Jesus is talking about two things. There was an end in 70 A.D. when Titus destroyed Jerusalem. And many of the things in Matthew, the 24th chapter, were fulfilled at that time. Now, uh, this may not relate to you, but um, uh, the people that are, are bringing forth the uh, amillennial teaching say that everything was fulfilled in 70 A.D., everything that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. They, re they regard the events that... Uh, uh, around 70 A.D. is the Great Tribulation, and they say we're all through the Great Tribulation and we're in the Millennium. Nice idea. And so uh, Jesus is talking then about two ends. Now, I'm not sure that we can always separate uh, when, as, he's, as he's looking down into the future, and he may be talking a bit about this end in 70 A.D. and the full end down in, uh, say, 1979, you know, or... 80 or 85, whatever. He may mix these events a little bit in here. I'm working on this. I, I'm going into it very carefully because there are some difficulties there to our understanding at the present time. And so in 70 A.D. there was an end. 
And it's quite significant that the ministry of the Apostle Paul came before that full end. The last of his books was written in about 68 B.C. He wrote all of his books in 68 B.C., uh, 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 before uh, 68 B.C. Then, on down the line, you see, we have a number of books that were written around 90 A.D., 90. Uh, the book of Revelation, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and possibly the book of Jude. It's rather significant that these little cluster of books are put on down after the fall of Jerusalem, because I think they are all pointing to that full end in which we are entering now, the Suntelia. They're entering into that. And so in Matthew 24, I think that some of the scriptures are applicable to both ends, wars and rumors of wars and so on, earthquakes and all of these things. They're applicable to both ends. And, uh, but the full end is certainly set forth by Jude and John in uh, the uh, last of the New Testament. That may help you maybe to kind of sort these scriptures out. But I know I'm working on that myself right now. By the way, uh, I just want to mention this again. When you are reading about the Apostle Paul, keep in mind that he was not only an apostle, and uh, the fundamentalist interpreters don't see this at all. They uh, really don't know how to handle Paul sometimes. But Paul was not only an apostle, but he was demonstrating the ministry of the sons of God ahead of time. He was demonstrating it ahead of time. And uh, he was the man that was caught up into the, apparently into the holiest of holies. Another thing about the Apostle Paul, uh, you remember in one place he, he told the church he wanted to present that church as, as a, a virgin, a pure virgin. And you see, that's what these sons of God are going to do. They're going to come back into the holy place. They're going to come back into the holy place. And they're going to cleanse the holy place so that the body of Christ's people will once again become a pure virgin. A pure virgin. Now, here's a curious thing about, uh, about the things of the Lord. If a man or a woman has lost his pureness, his virginity, before marriage, there's no possible way for him to recover it. But in the workings of God, God can take a man who's been in sin and been adulterous and all of these things, and he can make him a pure virgin. And so Paul, in talking to these people, desired that they might be a pure virgin. And remember we told you that these people up here are the sons of the bride chamber. And the sons of the bride chamber prepare the bride. They prepare the bridegroom. And this will be the work of the, of the body uh, of the holy, of holy people. And they're going to prepare this people to become united unto Christ, to become his bride. And this work is probably finished at the end of the seven-year period, as nearly as I can tell. And uh, another thing about the Apostle Paul was that he bound the strong man over cities. He comes to Ephesus, and uh, he does this with a company of other spirit-baptized men. And this company of spirit-baptized men fight with wild beasts. Now, this doesn't mean that they put him out in the amphitheater and he had a a joust with some lions and elephants and things. That isn't it at all. He was fighting the demonic powers that ruled over Ephesus. And he overcame them. And we know this because the strong man over Ephesus was bound. And the blessing of God was released to the city. It says that the word of the Lord prevailed. This is another thing that uh, the sons of God are going to do. And they're going to come in and they're going to bind fully and forever, the strong men over nations and over states and over counties and over cities and over neighborhoods, because there is this terrific hierarchy that is labored over the whole earth, and they're going to bind these strong men, they're going to bind them, and they're going to cause the word of the Lord to prevail. And you remember that Ephesus was a headquarters for idolatry. And uh, they're going to bind the, the idolatry. They're going to bind whatever that strong man represents. They're going to bind it. Eric Prince had a little article one time that was very good. And he said the strong man over, um, over Boston was intellectualism. And uh, the strong man over New Orleans was, uh, I think, licentiousness, Mardi Gras, and so on. And he went and named some of the great cities of America. And each one will have a characteristic strong man over them. I remember one time that 
uh, a friend of mine took me to San Francisco. I hadn't been there for years and years and years. And I wanted to get the feel of the place. And when I came there, I just felt like uh, I, I never felt such spiritual pressure as we walked about in downtown San Francisco. The homosexual thing and all that crap, you know, the financial demons. And it was a tremendous thing. But you know, something happened. The Holy Ghost fell on us and we began talking in tongues. And uh, <laughs> for a split second or two, I felt as though we could bind that strong man. And I know the time is going to come when this power within us is going to be released. And these sons of God are going to bind the strong man. See, this is uh, another picture. This is more than, than the ordinary apostolic ministry here. But this was a ministry of, of Paul demonstrating what the sons of God are going to be like in that day. Praise the Lord. All right, Glenn has disappeared, so uh, we'll have to talk till he gets back, I guess. All right, sister? So what? The breastplate. The breastplate. Oh. Okay. See, the uh, breastplate, the, the high priest. Remember now, not just ordinary priests wore the breastplate, but only the high priest. Oh, he's pinned up there. And uh, there were 12 stones, and in each stone was written one of the names of the uh, children of Israel. And so, in effect, you see, he bore the names of the children of Israel in his heart, and then the breastplate was fastened to the, sho to the shoulders. And uh, speaking of the, of the fact that, uh, that he's also bearing the responsibility, the government of these people. And uh, if we would come into the Holy of Holies, we must be concerned about people. We must put their names upon our breastplate. As we pointed out to you, the breastplate with us is not on the outside of the breast, it's on the inside of the breast. And uh, Paul says in Philippians 1, 7, I have you in my heart. So to bear the breastplate means uh, that uh, we're concerned about people, and we hold them before the Lord. We're concerned about the body of Christ. I rather think that, uh, uh, you know, there's a stone there where we could write, uh, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. Amen. Huh? How many of you think you'd like to write that on your breastplate? Amen. See? Pray for, Mount, for Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. See? The names of your children, your neighbors, the bad people. Not only the good people, but the bad people. Eutychus, the Syntyche, the people that make trouble. You write them up on your breastplate. This speaks of the uh, work of intercession. So we go into the Holy of Holies as priests, not as kings. But if we go in as priests wearing breastplates, remember that there's a crown laid up for us, not for us only, but for all those that love his appearing. And the breastplate people will receive the crown. All right, I think maybe we better bring... All right, one more, then we'll bring it to a close. All right, read that for us. Yes. I think there is probably talking uh, more about the breastplate of the armor, but uh, it's the same idea there. There's a breastplate for us to wear. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. All right, Glenn. The Lord bless you. Now, do you have any other questions? David Bunch is here. Let's stand and... Brother Lee just reminded us what privilege we have. We can bind their kings with chains, and that's what we can do now. We're going to be doing it. Amen. We will bind their kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron. This privilege of all you saints, we will bind their kings with chains. We will bind their kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron. This privilege of all our saints, we will bind their kings with chains. We will bind their kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron. This privilege of all our saints, we will bind their kings with chains. We will bind their kings with chains. And the nobles with fetters of iron, this privilege of all we say, we will bind their 
kings with chains. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.